So I'm from an organisation called Socialist Resistance. I'm based in London. And yeah, first off, thank you for the Socialist Alliance and Resistance for inviting me. Um, I'm still recovering from jet lag, so just like bear with me. Um, so I'm here to talk about something pretty strange that's been happening in British politics over the last two years. We had a guy called Jeremy Corbyn, who I think would best be described as a, a left democratic socialist, or maybe a left social democrat, if you're being a bit uncharitable. Uh, is leader of the Labour Party, and we could be a few years away, or even months away, from putting uh, a socialist on 10 Downing Street. Uh, but before I talk about that, yeah. 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 That's great. Uh, but before I talk about that, it's probably useful to like give a brief outline of what's been happening in Britain since 2010 and how we got to this situation. So attacks on the uh, youth in Britain, the working class in Britain, have been brutal. Uh, since the Tory government, the Conservative government, came, came to power in 2010, young people have borne the brunt of austerity measures that first David Cameron and Theresa May have been forcing through. In 2010, tuition fees were tripled to £9,000 a year, or about $15,000 Australian dollars a year, and the education, educational maintenance allowance, which is a small grant that acts as a lifeline for working class students uh, between the ages of 16 and 18 was scrapped. Uh, and then more recently, living grants for university students were also scrapped, meaning that students are forced to borrow even more money uh, to survive during their studies, uh, unless their parents are rich enough to pay for it. That means, so I, I'm in the middle of a free year undergraduate degree, and by the time I leave, I'm going to be £50,000 of debt, or about 82000 Australian dollars. Uh, so youth centres, libraries, mental health services, careers advice and schools have also faced the Tory acts and capacity of workers to resist these cuts has also been uh, tapped with the 2015 trade union bill putting heavy restrictions on strike action and limiting the potential for solidarity figures. Uh, so we have a scenario where since 2010 life has become a lot shittier, uh, want of a better word for many workers in Britain and especially young people. And an interesting fact that Britain is the only EU country apart from Greece that has experienced actual wage depression, not just the uh, rise in wages since the 2008 financial crash. Mm -hmm. um, and so in 2015, we had a general election, and like the situation seemed pretty ripe to launch uh, a challenge to the Tory austerity that had been making people's lives a misery for the past five years. But the Labour Party, which was still in, in the control of the right, did what it's been doing since 1997. Uh, so instead of putting up an anti-austerity candidate, they put up Ed Miliband, uh, who was sort of an uninspiring centrist. But uh, his father was actually a Marxist, but unfortunately he didn't seem to have uh, inherited his politics. Um, so, and despite some opinion polls predicting a hung parliament, uh, Labour were resoundingly defeated, and the Conservatives were given a, a mandate to continue their programme of austerity. <clears throat> so then this led to a leadership election within the Labour Party, which everyone, including myself, sort of expected would just be a, you know, a formality. This is swearing in another Blairite candidate, and. Labour will continue to lose seats, uh, or maybe in like the very best situation, it would be like a, a soft leftist who would, you know, be a bit of a wet. Um, but instead, we got someone, well, Corbyn, uh, who's been a lifelong socialist and a committed activist, who's remained on the, the radical fringes of the Labour Party since he became an MP in 1983. Um, to sort of give you an idea of how marginalised he, he was within the party. Um, between uh, 1997 and 2010, the Labour in the government, he rebelled against the party line 428 times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Including stuff like the Iraq War, all the, private, all the privatization stuff. So, you know, he's a, he's a hard character. Um, but, you know, every time, so Corbyn got on the ballot paper uh, in quite a dramatic fashion. So they, they he needed a, 35 nominations from the members of parliament, um, and he got his 35th uh, within two minutes of the deadline. Um, and so, you know, we were excited about that. Uh, um, but at the same time, so for every year, or every time there's a leadership election, the, the hard left stands a candidate, but they don't really tend to get more than five, six, seven, maybe eight percent on a good election. The 2015 was different, people were ready for a change in Corbyn's politics as well as his own personality, which is sort of characterised by like, humility and earnestness. I mean, when you've seen videos from him speak, he's a very humble person, very quiet person, very polite person. And he provided a clear alternative to a generation that was tired of 
you know, plastic politicians who just swept through uh, neoliberal reforms. And so, you know, the leadership election of 2015 was an incredibly inspiring event to the extent that some of my older comrades who have been through decades of struggle on the left uh, remarked that it was the most exciting political, political development in Britain in their lifetime. Um, hundreds of thousands of people, predominantly young people, flocked into the party to vote for Corbyn during the election, with the party's membership going from 130,000 to half a million within the space of three months. Um, so Corbyn, so he spent a year as leader, and then he had to contest another leadership election because the Blairite wing of the party blamed him for the Brexit vote. Um, but he won that again with an increased vote share, which is a, you know, pretty dirt in the Blairite space. Um, um, but during all this time, you know, he was still facing challenges from his, the Blairite black backbench MPs and, of course, the capitalist press. He used every opportunity to smear him. And earlier this year, so sort of around March, April time, he, uh, the Conservatives had a 25-point lead in the polls because he was seen as not being a strong leader. He was consistently demonised. So to reason May did what uh, Conservatives always do. They sort of capitalised on things. Um, and she called a general election, thinking that she would you know, sweep the board. Um, you know, she came out very uh, strident about it. Um, and she thought it was in the bag. And we thought it was in the back, you know, I was like, I was terrified, and the whole left were terrified. I actually put um, five pounds on Labour falling to 170 seats, which would have been the worst election defeat since 1935. Um, and I've never been happier to lose a fiver. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so despite it seeming hopeless, Corbyn came out fighting. The manifesto the party put forward, uh, titled For the Many, Not the Few, including radical ideas such as renationalising the railways, Raising the minimum wage to ten pounds an hour, or uh, sixteen uh, Australian dollars forty, um, appealing anti-trade union legislation, and most importantly, I think the abolition of tuition fees. Mm. And to give an idea of the general message of the campaign, I'm going to read a short extract from one of the official campaign broadcasts that was put out by the Labour Party. You know, not Momentum, not a left group. This was put out by the Labour Party. <clears throat> so we demand health, work, home, education, and care in time of need. Not subject to grand profiteering, but planned, transparent, and executed in efficient fashion under democratic control using our intelligence and imagination. We demand the full fruits of our labour. We demand the right to contribute and recognise the obligation to share. Power concedes nothing without demand. It never did and it never will. We have one short, precious life, and we demand the chance to be all that we can. Um, so that sort of gives you an idea of how. Yeah. <laughs> So that gives you an idea of how far left the party had moved under Corbyn, and this was definitely a message that resonated with young people. Um, and you can see that in the early stages of the election, where we saw record numbers of young people registering to vote. Um, I, we don't have the figures, uh, the exact figures of how many young people registered, but the total number was two million people registered to vote between the time the election was called and the cutoff point. Um, and so, first began the campaign. Um, a lot of it, uh, the key part of it was social media, so uh, Mentum, which is a pro-Corbyn organisation within the Labour Party, produced a series of short videos which they claimed were seen by one third of people in Britain, I mean, take that figure with a bit of salt, uh, but they were very you know, watchable, shareable, uh, hit home with some of the key political messages, and some of the trade unions as well, the National Union of Teachers produced like a really uh, clear and good website that highlighted the cuts to primary and secondary education that, that would happen in Theresa May got her way. Um, so you could search for your own school and see how much will be cut exactly. And you know, it's an excellent tool, I think. Uh, and the election saw a significant link, linking of politics and culture for the first time in decades. So rappers and musicians played a, call in, played a role in promoting the Corbyn campaign, in particular with the creation of the Grime, Grime for Corbyn initiative. Uh, for those of you who don't, don't know, Grime is a sort of yeah. former pit pop that developed in London about 15 years ago and has become a sort of staple of uh, British working class culture, especially uh, amongst the black uh, Afro Caribbean population in London and in the other large cities. So, various Grime artists came together to put on a gig which fans could win tickets to if they registered the vote, which in retrospect was probably a gross violation of like electoral laws. <laughs> 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 and it's, I mean, it, it seems it was a small thing, but it's likely that, you know, these artists coming out played uh, 
a big part in swinging the vote in the inner city, um, inner city areas where Labour's vote had been ebbing away for the last 25 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, and another cultural aspect I should mention is that the, the Corbyn campaign created a football manifesto uh, where Labour pledged to tax large Premier League teams and support community sports and smaller teams and you know, local football, which you know struck a chord with uh, anyone who knows how expensive ticket prices are in the UK. Um, but despite all of this brilliant work done on social media, it was probably the huge mobilisations of door-to-door -door activists that played the decisive factor in the election. So Momentum produced an online tool called My Nearest Marginal, which allowed activists who lived in safe Labour seats like myself uh, to find campaigning events in either Tory-held seats that Labour had a chance of winning, or Labour seats that were, that were uh, at risk of you know, going Conservative. And it's estimated that, we, again, we don't have the figures because it uh, wasn't... Uh, Research, but it's you know tens of thousands of activists that's got involved uh, in the in the campaign doing door knocking, <clears throat> and then so in Britain uh, it's a, the, the most important part of election campaigning is going out on election day itself, and so I did a lot of my campaigning in Battersea, which was a Tory constituency in North London, uh, South London even, um, and then so on election day, hundreds of activists flooded into the constituency. Uh, to the point where there was no room to move in the campaign HQ and we were running out of clipboards and in many other constituencies activists were just turned away by the local party because there was no resources left, they were told to go to a different constituency to campaign. Uh, most of the campaigners were first timers, young people uh, who worked from 7am to 10pm when the polls opened and closed. Um, so throughout the short election period things were turning in our favour, however despite the massive turnaround uh, in Corbyn's popularity uh, we cut the Conservative lead from 25 points to about 5 or 6 points in a matter of 6 weeks or so. Uh, the Conservative majority was still the most likely outcome. So it was a huge shock when the exit poll was released. Uh, we all had a huge party and did permanent damage to our livers. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and Labour won seats that were previously considered unwinnable. So one such seat was Canterbury in the southeast of England, which has been Tory since the 1850s. Um, and despite being the very conservative part of England, it has a university, and it was the mobilisation of students in that university and the inspiration of young people that managed to turn that um, constituency red. Um, so even though the Conservative Party is still in power, you know, their gamble didn't pay off. Uh, they were deprived of their majority. So now they're in a coalition with the far-right Protestant Sectarian Democratic Unionist Party. <laughs> you know, that, so a large part, there's an irony to this, because a large part of the Conservatives' election campaign was criticising Corbyn's links with Sinn Féin, uh, and criticising links with extremists in Northern Ireland, uh, or the North of Ireland. Um, but now they're in the DUP, so there you go. Um, and Theresa May was dealt a deadly blow, and even though she remains Prime Minister, She's a damaged figure, and there's pretty much no chance of her staying on long enough to contest the, the next election. Um, but ultimately, it was the youth vote that scored Corbyn this victory. Not only did young people vote overwhelmingly for Labour, 65% of those 18 and 24 voted for the party, but young people voted in the highest numbers in 25 years, with around 60% of those aged between 18 and 24 turning out in this election, compared with 44% uh, in the 2015 election. Um, and this left me like many in the aftermath, this left many sort of political pundits scratching their heads because the received wisdom is that young people don't care about politics, we're not engaged, that we don't vote. Um, so a couple of days after the election I was listening to this BBC radio programme that had some analysts talking about the youth turnout and why it was unusually high. Uh, the two reasons they could come up with were one, young people were bribed to vote Labour with the promise of the abolition of tuition fees. Um, and two, it's my favourite one, it was cool to vote Labour and people were doing it because it was a fad. Uh, yeah, but I would like to put forward a sort of alternative theory about why the youth turn out for Labour. As I've mentioned earlier, we're on the receiving end of attacks from the government in terms of wages, tuition fees and rights of work. Two major world, two major world historic events people are watching on television were the Iraq war, and the disastrous consequences of the invasion and the 2008 financial crash. Mm -hmm. So it really should not come as a surprise that when a politician comes to mind, he's willing to stand up for the rights of the working class mm -hmm. and opposes imperialist in intervention and unrestricted free market capitalism, that young people will become energised around politics. Mm -hmm. 
And when we feel there is no option for us, we become disengaged, which is why youth turnout dropped so dramatically during the years of Blair, Brown, and Miller Band. Mm. Um, so yeah, and what's been particularly inspiring is how this mobilisation has not slowed down since the election. So a lot of you may have you know, heard about the Grenfell uh, Tower disaster in London. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it, it was, Grenfell was a tower block in uh, London that housed about 600 residents. It was a 24 storey and it caught fire because of poor maintenance by the local Conservative Council and the official death toll of the fire stands at about 80, although it's probably going to rise to about 100 when the official uh, inquiry is uh, released. And after this, there were you know, huge mobilizations, spontaneous mobilizations. They, people invaded like the local council building. Um, and what was notable about it is how the demonstrators recognized that social class was a key part of uh, why these people had died. People had died because the Conservative Council didn't care about working class people. And I think this is, you know, this rearticulation of class amongst young people is definitely a result of the Corbyn campaign and the message it had, you know, with the, the slogan for the many, not the few, you know. It's a bit like Bernie Sanders, you know, for the billions, not the billionaires. <clears throat> so, in conclusion, despite all this being very exciting, it's important to keep some perspective. Labour didn't win the election, Corbyn still faces challenges from the right wing of his party and the press. Mm. Furthermore, electing a Corbyn government won't make everything great immediately. You know, he'll face attacks from the banks, the press, the state, and all the other institutions of the ruling class. And this is why it's always important not to just focus solely on the Labour Party, but also to build militant mass movements and trade unions um, that can struggle outside the parliamentary realm. <clears throat> It is also important to mention, and I'll speak a bit, a bit more about this tomorrow in my session, that the political content of the Corbyn leadership hasn't always been great, especially on the issue of free movement uh, and migrants, uh, migrant workers' rights. But despite this, for the first time in my life, I'm pretty cautiously optimistic about the future of British politics. Um, you know, we had 12 million people voting for a socialist programme that promoted nationalisation and pro-worker policies. And Labour got its biggest... Uh, uh, swing in the share of the vote since 1945. So, you know, remain cautiously excited, but remain excited at the same time. <laughs> <laughs>